chosen. President Trump chose to hold a press conference after his signing of two executive orders today. At this press conference, he gives a short account of the agony he faces each week given that he has to sign letters designated to the parents of soldiers who died in Middle East theater wars. So we'll watch his account, then I will chime in. The hardest thing I have to do, by far, much harder than the witch hunt, is signing letters to parents of soldiers that have been killed. And it's not only that, in areas where there's not a lot of upside, if there's any upside at all, and in many cases, there's only downside. And especially when that soldier was killed in a blue-on-green attack. You know what that is, right? That's where a soldier being trained or whatever turns his gun on an American soldier. Here, son, take your gun. You know how to use it. And he takes the gun and he turns it and he shoots one. We have many of them in Afghanistan, in particular in Afghanistan. The hardest thing I have to do is signing those letters. That's the hardest thing I have to do. And each letter is different. We make each letter different. And last week, I signed five of them for Afghanistan, one in Iraq, one in Syria from two weeks ago. And sometimes I call the parents. Sometimes I see the parents. I go to Dover when I can, but it's, it's, it's so devastating for the parents that, you know, it's, it's so devastating. When they, when they bring uh, that boy or young woman out of the back of those big, powerful planes in a coffin, and the parents are there. You know, we have people that do that. That's what they do. They, they, they work that. They accommodate everybody. That's what they do. They do an incredible job. And they said, I said, the parents seem to be OK. I'll get there early. The parents seem to be OK. Well, actually, sir, they are. No, no, the way they're talking, they're really OK, aren't they? Sir, you never know until the back of that massive cargo plane opens up and they walk and he's about to give the account of what happens when the massive door of the cargo plane opens up. And just this portion here, Trump takes you into his world of, you know, seeing the letters, knowing what the letters represent. And he also conveys how hard it is specifically to sign those letters in those situations where there's friendly fire that results in a troop's death. Just imagine that, imagining the guilt of that tugging at his heartstrings, especially considering that for these countries where we're occupying, the citizens that this president is defending, the U.S. citizens at home, are not any specific danger. To be in that kind of position, can you imagine the stress it puts on a person? He's saying that's far worse than the... Uh, you know, the political hunt that he's a part of now. So let's continue. Down, holding a coffin with four or five great soldiers on each side of it, representing our various forces, that you never know. And then I see it, and I see people that were smiling. Oh, Mr. President, thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. And I think they're doing great. And then 20 minutes later, we'll be outside when that big plane pulls up and that door comes down. And they are walking the coffin with their boy inside this coffin with an American flag over the top. And they're walking that coffin down this ramp. And I've seen people that I thought were really incredible the way they were. I didn't even understood how they could take it so well. They scream like I've never seen anything before. Sometimes they'll run to the coffin. They'll break through military barriers. They'll run to the coffin and jump on top of the coffin, crying, mothers and wives, crying desperately. Uh, and this is on these endless wars that just never stop. And, and there you have it. You have that scene. You have the president standing aside. The, the family members of the loved one run through the crowd, run through the military barricade to jump onto the coffin 
knowing that their loved one lies inside, knowing that they'll never see their loved one again in a living flesh since that person was sent overseas. He does a very good job at conveying the sense of devastation that these people have as they wail out, just crying out loudly. Anyways, we'll continue. There's a time and there's a place, but it's time to stop. And uh, just to finish, last Friday I went to Walter Reed and I gave out five Purple Hearts to incredible uh, young men, in this case, all men. And they took a beating. Beautiful people, they took a beating. One couldn't be there because the beating was so great that he was at a totally different part of the world. He lost a leg, he lost an arm. Ryan, he had tremendous damage beyond even what these young folks went through. But I'll tell you what, for me, it's very hard when I see that. It's very hard. It's easy to talk tough, you know, tough guys, all these tough guys. Let's keep fighting, let's keep fighting. They had to go to Walter Reed where they do unbelievable work. I have to tell you, these doctors are unbelievable. You know, it's easy to say, oh, they're not, the, they're the best in the world. I've never seen anything like it. One young man last week had his nose rebuilt. And they said it was in a thousand pieces. And I said, so where were you hurt? He said, my face, sir, was almost obliterated. I said, you have a better face than I do. He said, sir, I had a doctor who was unbelievable. And they put it together. They said, a, he said a thousand fragments. Now, I don't know if that's even possible, but a thousand fragments. And they put it together. And his father, who was crying, came up to me and said, uh, you're not going to believe this, but my son didn't have a great looking nose, and now his nose is better. OK, it's an amazing thing. But when you see these at the Purple Hearts, you see this kind of thing. And I see a lot of it at Walter Reed. And again, uh, the job uh, those doctors and the people do at Walter Reed, it's something to be commended. Thank you all very much. Thank you. And that ends that segment. It's very easy to say, orange man bad. But sometimes the circumstance of what we hear, what is considered to be normalized, they blind us from the truth that those individuals whom we consider to be our mortal enemies may in fact have a tinge of humanity after all. Just take a moment to imagine things from this man's perspective where he sees the cause and effect of war. A man who's aware that he is ultimately responsible for the numbers and types of casualties that occur. In these foreign theater engagements, all of these engagements, of course, started under the doctrine of preemption. There is a story that Trump stopped taking direct control over the choice for drone strikes in March of the year he was inaugurated. This is the same type of control that his predecessor, Barack Obama, had during his entire administration. So when looking over the work, the resume of this man, Trump, I have to take a close reflection of my own biases. How easy is it to castigate someone you don't completely understand? He tried to remove the troops from Syria many months ago, but of course he was thwarted by what he mentions as a military type industrial complex. President Trump is not the same as former President Bush. Evidence continues to accumulate that they do not share the same perspective on war. This man demonstrates character and specific ideals that are more like what individuals wanted, these individuals I consider to be moderate independents, wanted in the early 2000s when it was announced that the U.S. would be conducting long-term engagements in Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm sure some of you remember exactly how strongly anti-war the mainstream was at that time in, let's say, 2003, 2004. This was the reason WMD was such a big topic at the time. 
Now look how things have changed. Uh, listener, if you found this piece interesting, I only ask that you engage it in some way. Give a thumbs up or a thumbs down, leave a comment, or subscribe. That's all. Peace.